I don't have an intro. Hi, I'm Agor, and um, literally 20 minutes ago I finished watching Upright, starring and partially by Tim Minchin and some other folks. Um, I had no intentions of making this video. Um, in fact, as of recording this, I'm working on other videos that I actually wanted to use to start this channel, yes? But this goddamn show. See, I had a feeling it would probably be not talked about enough, and so I went on YouTube, looked it up, and proved myself right. I found literally one review, and it's like a five minute review by two folks who haven't even seen the whole thing. And to be fair, I can understand the uh, lackluster appeal of the show. I mean, I myself would probably never have watched it if it didn't have Tim Minchin's name attached to it. It's actually the same reason why I bothered watching Californication a good while ago, and indeed why I watched this. Now y'all gotta understand, I walked into this show based on nothing other than Tim Minchin's name and that little half-minute teaser on YouTube with Tim and a camel. And that's basically all I knew, but that's all I needed because you see, I walked into this being a pretty huge Tim Minchin fanboy. And I have to emphasize the fanboy bit because I'm not just a fan. Um, to my mind, Tim Minchin can do no wrong. And I think that because so far, I haven't seen or heard anything from him or in any way attached to him that I didn't like. Except for that Robin Hood thing that he did. But that was a very minor role anyway, and I am very happy to just overlook that as far as his resume is concerned, just like a proper fanboy would. So I walked into this show, being a huge Tim Fun fanboy, and right now, not even 30 minutes after finishing the show, I think I can distinctly say I'm an even bigger fanboy of his, simply because you know, before I watched it, which I literally started two days ago, and I um, basically did it in two concentrated binge sittings, I knew Tim to be a brilliant musician, brilliant comedian, brilliant vocalist, but I, I had no idea he would also turn out to be a great screenwriter, director, and above all, that good of an actor. Because, for real, because you see, in this show he has to portray some very complex, very deep, very tragic stuff. Uh, certain aspects of which I can't really recall ever seeing in a television show or a movie. Definitely not something commonly seen. Some of the themes and ideas this show tackles are definitely A. Not very commonplace and B. Not particularly for the faint of heart. Which I never considered myself. Uh, to be, but this show definitely brought up something from within me that I didn't even really know was there. And it really resonated with me and it really spoke to me on levels and in ways that I obviously didn't anticipate and that um, don't really paint a good picture about me. Now I'm not going to overanalyze uh, this resonance and this connection I established with the show based on my personal experiences and uh, thanks. But I do want to just briefly talk about the show because, again, it's not talked about anywhere near as much as it should be, I don't think. And obviously a brand new channel like mine with zero viewership, zero everything, is the perfect place to provide more coverage. So, Upright, um, well, it is very hard to talk about this show without spoilers, but I will say this. The basic premise. Tim plays a character called Lucky, and he is driving across 30-something kilometers of the vast Australian desert uh, to deliver an old piano somewhere, presumably back to his family. And as he's driving, he has a mild car crash with a 16-year-old girl called Meg. Now, in the crash, Meg's car takes no real damage, but she does 
I don't know if she full out breaks her arm, but she definitely injures her arm, ends up having, ends up with a cast over it, so she can no longer drive. So they agree to basically uh, drive the rest of the distance together, because um, Meg is on her way to her mom's for one reason or another once again, and turns out their destinations are actually quite close, so they can definitely cover most of the journey together. A bit of a I'll scratch your back, you'll scratch mine sort of situation. And away they go! And that's essentially... well, first of all that's the arc of the first episode, and the basic premise, and the beginning of the story, and effectively all that I can say without spoiling, because every successive episode reveals more of both of these characters' backstories, and that's where... that's basically where the whole plot really goes, and that's all that really matters in the show. It's all about them, their relationship, what they've both been through. I mean, the show quickly starts talking about fate, and uh, happy accidents, or, as well as some unhappy accidents, of course, um, but... The gist of the plot absolutely is them two together and them bonding. Basically, it's a it's a buddy road movie. That's what this show is. I wouldn't necessarily say a buddy road movie comedy. I do know the show is being categorized as comedy in most places that I that I found, um, and I have to disagree with that quite harshly. Um, at most, it's a dramedy, but. I would actually, I would actually argue that it's a full-on raw, very raw human drama with the occasional joke or two thrown in for a little comic relief, but nothing, nothing to really make it a comedy, uh, to my mind. So yeah, uh, a spoiler-free verdict, a quick capsule review, if you will. I can say it's, it's a buddy road movie split into eight episodes. The total runtime isn't even four hours, like, you know, not n neither of the episodes is uh, even a full half hour. So it's basically a really long stretched out road movie split into eight episodes. And I gotta say, at no point does it actually feel like a show. It doesn't really feel like the first season of a potential show. I don't think there's gonna be season two at all, but I'll get more into that in the spoilers as well. But, that's a pro-argument also, uh, in case you, like me, always hesitate to watch a new show because you just don't want to commit to a potentially long, long show packed full of way too many seasons, you know. I don't think that's a concern with Upright. It literally is a long road movie and I'm pretty sure that's where it ends. Because, yeah, another thing, without spoilers, I can tell you the show has a very distinct, clear opening, beginning, start. I'm not sure I can think of too many more synonyms. And it also has a very clear, conclusive ending. The story is completely self-contained. And yeah, if there ever was a season two, I can imagine some scenarios, but neither of those feels very right. I mean, if they actually continue the story with the same characters, there are some ways they could, you know, come up with something that would work. But the genre would be completely changed. I cannot see a way how they could once again make it a road movie. A body road movie with the same characters. I, I, I just definitely cannot see how that would work. The other way I could think of them doing it uh, would be to indeed change the genre and just continue the story. But I don't think they would do that either, because... Well, yeah, I can't say much more on that without spoilers, but what I can say is... And this is something that some people might disagree with, um, but to my mind, the ending is very, very open to interpretation. It's not, to my mind, conclusively happy or conclusively sad or bad or anything like that. I just, I think it's open for interpretation. So if they were to continue the story with the existing characters, it could go in a number of directions. But if it did, I can't help but feel like it would be very predictable. Of course, based on my own interpretation of the ending. But we'll get there. But yeah, 
All said and done, if you haven't seen this show and if you are a fan of deeply, profoundly human stories and, you know, relationships, you can you truly cannot go wrong with this show. I mean, it's it's brilliant. Like I said, it's it's predominantly about well, what every body road movie is about. Two unlikely individuals bond an unshakable friendship. <laughs> and then there's also threats about fate and happy accidents and uh, many, many other themes and ideas that have to do with both of the protagonists' backstories. Again, revealed piece by piece in each episode, all the way until the final episode, where the final piece of the overall puzzle is revealed. So, yeah, I mean, you don't get the full picture until the final episode, so it's one of those, it's one of those shows. Yeah, like I, like I already said, the acting is brilliant, not just Tim, but everyone involved is giving it their all. Uh, it's a delight to behold, truthfully. It also looks beautiful in terms of cinema, in terms of cinematography. 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 Cinema cinematography. Cinematography. That's how you say that word. And the direction, and the soundtrack, and uh, every frame is gorgeous and purposeful. Nothing in this show feels like it should be cut out. And it never feels like there's something missing. Clearly this had spent a lot of time in the editing room and they knew what they were doing, they knew what they were going for. And the end result is... Like I said, all in all, really short. Three and a half hours for a show is nothing. It's, it's very bingeable, it's very uh, addictive. I'm not gonna say it's addictive right off the bat. I mean, the first episode, it establishes everything nicely, but it doesn't necessarily hook you. But from the second episode on, you're gone, dude. There's... you're gone. And the last thing I want to say without spoiling anything, and then elaborate on, in spoilers. I think the script is incredibly tight and everything really works together nicely with one exception. One tiny hiccup on an otherwise seamlessly smooth road into some very very bittersweet happiness. That's it. That's... I, I, I don't think I can say anything else. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Real talk, do my do my boy Tim some favor here. He is already so very underappreciated. Alright, let's talk about some spoilers now. So, I guess I might as well open this section with, you know, a little rundown of the whole story of both Lucky and Meg. Let's start with Meg because her portion is kind of simpler. Turns out! First of all, she's not 16, she's 13, which does become an issue, but not that big of an issue, but that has to do with that other thing, and we'll get that. She is actually 13, she lies about her age, and she is not uh, traveling to stay with her moms. Her mom has been out of the picture for a very long time, she knows nothing about her mom, and she's actually just escaping her uh, drunken father who has been drinking for the better part of the last, shall we say, 10 months because his son and Meg's older brother killed himself. Her mother is not actually important, she's not in the picture at all. Meg is actually just on the run. She is going nowhere, but she is nevertheless on the run. And in the end, um, she... <sighs> This is uh, kind of her arc coming to a coming to a close, in a way, as you know. When the show begins, of course, she is kind of well all about herself, obviously. But at the end, she puts on a little show for Lucky, so that Lucky thinks she is indeed uh, reuniting with her mom, and so that Lucky can then comfortably finish his journey to uh, his family, and then she just. She just starts walking around, basically, and literally, like, you know, gives up her car. Well, not her car anymore, really, I mean, that is gone, they steal a car later. That's, again, kind of irrelevant. But yeah, I mean, 
she goes from a typical self-centered self -centered teenager with some deep-seated issues dealing with her uh, dead brother and her drunken father and all these things into someone, into, into a young woman who, who is capable of a little self-sacrifice for somebody else's benefit, in this case Lucky's. And that's a pretty big deal and it's a pretty big, uh, you know, bombshell to drop at the uh, only in the final episode, barely, barely a few minutes before the actual ending, I think about it. Although, you know, I could be actually, I could be actually uh, remembering this all wrong. Um, maybe it was the second last episode. I've only finished it half an hour ago and it's already kind of uh, messing up in my head. My apologies, it's all very fresh, completely improv, completely off script, not that, not that there's any script ever, but you know. Now that's not the last, last thing that happens with Meg, but we'll get to the other thing later. Let's talk about Lucky for a bit, because this is, at the end of the day, his show and his piano. And his story more so than anybody else's. Lucky is driving to see his family again after eight years of being absent um, because his mother is dying of cancer and of course she wants one last goodbye and so does he. And Lucky has an older brother, Toby, who is pestering him uh, pretty much all throughout the journey. And we don't really know why. I mean, we get a couple of flashbacks, again, progressively more and more, and we progressively get more and more pieces uh, as the episodes go on. The first big revelation with Lucky is one stupid drunken night, he humped Toby's wife. And, uh, well, we are basically led to believe Toby found out they had a big fight, as, as you do, and, well, at, somewhere at that point Lucky took off and stayed well away uh, from the family. And then we learn that that drunken check led to the birth of little Billy. Lucky's daughter, who, however, is being raised by Toby and Toby's wife. Now, this woman will forever have to be referred to as Toby's wife because hers is the one name I definitely won't be able to recall. That, that is a big thing. Um, you know, having to deal with the scolding hatred of your own brother because you slept with his wife and you impregnated his wife and the baby is now being raised by them too while you are living in solitude somewhere far away. That's lucky, in a nutshell. But, you know, his mom starts dying. That, that's a weird sentence, his mom starts dying. I mean, technically it's not wrong, I guess, but... Anyways, he decides to make that journey, go the distance, driving, unfortunately, uh... It comes up, actually, more than once. Why didn't he just, you know, ship the piano and uh, get himself a plane ticket? Um, and really, the only, the only argument we get is he just didn't have the money. And it's not really hard to not buy that. Lucky being really super broke is also a recurring theme in the show. But anyways, he decides this piano of his is a really old piano that uh, initially belongs to Lucky's grandmother and thus Billy's great-grandmother and he travels with it so as to give the piano as a gift to little Billy who actually happens to have a birthday party uh, somewhere during the time Lucky is supposed to be there and so he finally arrives and of course, his, his mom is there, and she's okay with it, and she's happy to see him. Toby's wife is there, and she's okay with him being there too. Toby arrives, along with little Billy, and 
You know, like I said, Toby uh, repeatedly texts Lucky as as he's driving and tries to tries to reach him for a phone call, and Lucky does not respond to any of the text messages or or, or any of the calls. Uh, but it seems clear Toby himself is in, you know interested in getting lucky there to say goodbye to the mom character at least I don't speak like a human being right now I'm sorry I believe Toby really believed he was ready to see his brother again but he wasn't as soon as he says him he implodes he just breaks down immediately rage filled tears show up on his face instantly and he just yeah he, he he lets loose he forgets the little kid is there little Billy is there to hear and see it all he just blacks everything around him out and he only sees lucky and he unloads all the hatred all that intensity that's built up in him over the last eight years unloads on his brother and uh, yeah in Lucky's defense he takes most of it right on the chin he tries to go for he, he tries to go for self-defense at one point and it's it's very short-sighted and very silly and gets rightfully squandered immediately but yeah I mean it's just and then Toby's wife has what I can only describe as the biggest brain fart of the show, where af just after Toby unloads all that vom, all that anger towards Lucky, that's when Toby's wife decides it's a good time to ask Lucky in front of Toby if he would like to tell little Billy that he's her actual biological father. So naturally, uh, this does not calm Toby down. It only adds to the fuel of the whole situation, as you might imagine. But, um, ultimately, everyone does calm down just a little bit. Lucky storms out, gets up onto the piano, starts tuning it. Uh, Toby initially uh, wants to forbid Lucky from giving little Billy any presents, let alone an old piano, but then uh, Meg enters this monologue where, you know, she basically just gives Toby and Toby's wife and the mother a uh, quick rundown of what she and Lucky uh, have been through and what they had to go through to actually get themselves and that piano to this Point. And she breaks down during this, because uh, it's not only a rundown of those events, but also Loki a rundown of how, you know, she went from that self-centered brat into a young woman. How she had to grow up really quickly, and she did, and uh, how Lucky helped her to uh, achieve all this. Basically, the point of that entire monologue was to show that Lucky is not just a narcissistic, egoistic man-child that has yet to put his life together, but, you know, that he's more than that. Well, I, as a viewer, um, I was moved, and Meg was moved, she, she, she obviously, tears were shed, and I could definitely see how Toby and his wife might have been moved as well. So much so that right after the monologue, Toby walks outside, joins uh, Lucky by the piano, not to reminisce about the good old days or anything, but just to tell him. And this sentence uh, really messed me up. He comes up to Lucky and tells him that the one thing that still does his head in after, after all these years is that if Lucky didn't do what he did, if he didn't hump his wife, Billy would have never been born, and she wouldn't exist now, and thus they would have no baby, presumably. So that sentence primed me. Then Toby calls on Billy for her to go, you know, talk, 
chat with her uncle and receive her gift. And so she does, she climbs up, uh, sits at the piano with Lucky, and this is where, uh, as, I, as I was previously primed, this is where the show just blasted me. Uh, I don't know, I don't know how else to say it, but it's mostly due to Tim's acting in this scene. But anyways, they they start talking about the piano, of course. Lucky gives Billy the history of the piano and they, you know, play it a little bit and whatnot. And then he tells her that the piano is for her and that he does not want her to uh, learn or practice on this piano, but just to play the piano whenever she feels like it and play whatever she feels like and that she shouldn't worry about mistakes, any potential mistakes she might make, because mistakes can sometimes accidentally create something beautiful. Mistakes can sometimes lead to happy accidents. And as he says this, uh, he also talks about how it's the only thing, the only thing he can do and in that moment, you know, Tim had the, I imagine, very thankless job of portraying a man who would want nothing more than to embrace his daughter and to tell her that it's his daughter. But he can't, and he knows he can't, and on the, you know, on the um, other hand, he also desperately wants to just reconnect with his family and if he is to reconnect with his family the cost will be the sacrifice of this potential bond father to daughter and he will have to make do with uncle to niece basically but anyways Tim's portrayal of all that of all those emotions in that scene, I thought it was pitch perfect. Like, I could not possibly imagine myself in the same position, but I definitely bought it. <laughs> I'll, I'll say that. I definitely believed him that that's the kind of turmoil he was going through at the, at the, at the moment. And then, anyhow, um, uh, you know, we basically skip over to the funeral of the mom, and we see a couple of things uh, that seemed to me a little too good to be true, and I'll say why that's important in a minute. But basically, first of all, we see Lucky and Toby jamming together again. Lucky on piano, Toby on guitar. The same song they've been practicing from childhood. And they are jamming together as if nothing ever happened. And at, at this point, this is their mother's funeral, and Lucky's scars from a fight he had to uh, undergo one episode prior are still there, barely healing, so seriously, like, two or three days could have passed at most. And they are jamming like, 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 they ironed out all of their issues. And right after that we also see Meg's father entering the scene, basically only having one thing to say, and that is, yeah, honey, I'm kind of done with alcohol at least for the foreseeable future, I'm going sober. And Meg jumps into his arms and they embrace and are reunited. And everyone is happy and Lucky walks outside and the final closing shot of the final episode and thus the whole show is just a close up of Lucky's face as he enjoys one more sigh of relief and gently smiles. And I cannot help but think this is not a happy ending at all. I mean, I think you could easily make an argument this entire uh, final sequence could just be in Lucky's head. I mean, we, we, we do see him hallucinating before. We know he's prone to it by this point. It could have been that, or it could have been just a dream. And you could easily make an argument for that. I think all the colors uh, in, the, in that scene and how everything is just a little too happy and too perfect. But let's say it's not that. Let's say this is actually what happens and this is how the show actually ends. I still don't think it's a very happy ending. 
because you don't resolve such big issues as what Toby has with Lucky, all that resentment and, and, and toxicity that builds up over eight years doesn't just go away. Not to mention, little Billy, sooner or later, has to learn, right? She has to learn that Lucky is actually her father and has been her father all along. And we can just hope that this happens in well into her adulthood when she, you know, is in... is at a level of maturity emotionally and intellectually where she understands and is able to cope with it. But, you know, chances are she learns a lot sooner than that. There's also the very, very real chance of Toby's wife and Lucky humping again at some point if they somehow stay together uh, as a family. I mean, that whole family unit, by the time the show ends, it still stands, but the foundation is very cracked and very fragile. And it would take very little for that foundation to just crack completely and for the whole thing to collapse and uh, on itself, basically. As for Meg and her father, uh, that might be a little easier to remedy, but I mean, Meg running away may have been the wake-up call her father needed to actually go sober. But I don't know. First of all, I, I have to imagine Meg will have to deal with a lot of resentment and trust issues as well, uh, for a good bit. And second of all, I don't really... I don't really know that many successful uh, going sober stories where it happens like that and uh, there's no further issues and hiccups down the line. Of course, this can be a happy ending even if there are later issues to resolve and deal with, but I think there's a little too much of it for bro both protagonists uh, that they will have to deal with very soon, you know, not in a distant future, but in the very foreseeable future after the uh, end credits finish rolling, where I, on one hand, I could see a second season that would deal with all this, but I can't see how it would be... how it wouldn't be too tragic, for one thing, and how it uh, wouldn't just, you know, basically uh, recycle itself and repeat itself. So, uh, all in all, I really don't think there ever could be a second season. I think this works perfectly well as a self-contained story that has a clear beginning, clear middle, and clear ending. Even though the ending, like I just uh, explained, I do think is very, very open to interpretations. And maybe how you interpret the ending and what you take away will depend heavily on your own mental state as you watch the show. Admittedly, my mental state right now is not... is not... uh, the best. <laughs> but hey, what do I know? Maybe I'm wrong. Now, before I let you all go, just one more thing. That, 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 that one hiccup on an otherwise perfectly smooth road, um, the one issue I had with the screenplay. Around the half point, either the fourth or maybe the fifth episode, is where Lucky learns that Meg is not in fact 16 but 13 and they have a fight. It's not a huge fight, all things considered. He just angrily uh, sends her to sleep and he himself continues drinking heavily, but just wine. And they are in this little get-together at the edge of Australia and Lucky doesn't pass out, but he clearly drinks a whole lot uh, before falling asleep because he sleeps right through all the ruckus, all the noise of everyone packing up and leaving because when he wakes up there's no one there. Everyone's gone, everyone's left, including Mac with Lucky's piano. Lucky uh, has no money, he's got nothing to drink, nothing to eat, of course. And he has a phone, but that might that might as well be dead. And even if it wasn't dead, it is established right in the first episode, really, that he doesn't really have anyone to call for help. So he starts walking, continuing west in the 
general direction he tries to tries to reach and he works for a long time I mean we see him have two Fatamorganas I think regular hallucinations um, we see him get bitten by a snake and he continues walking he passes out finally has more has more hallucinations more dreams when he comes to he is laying in the middle of the road perfectly between two trucks one heading west one east um, he tells him about the snake bite they tell him that uh, the nearest hospital is uh, back east, so he gets up, is all ready to... Siri! Just before he gets on the truck heading east, that driver mentions he did in fact pass Meg. Or, well, he passed a car with a very little person behind the wheel and a piano at the back, so... Lucky, previously being very concerned for his life regarding the snake bite, decides to drop all that get on the truck heading west instead, where he's happy to consume some drugs and just have a nap, basically. And either he will wake up or not. Because of course, depends on whether or not that uh, snake bite was deadly. And yeah, so he's okay with all that, so they are, they are driving. And meanwhile, Meg is also driving. And she enjoys a little inner uh, dialogue with her dead brother. And she enjoys it so much, she ends up uh, crashing the car again. And I think she crashes into a baby camel. Like, I know they get to bury a baby camel together, but I'm not actually sure if she crashed into the baby camel. It's a bit fuzzy right now because I'm high on tea and... But what is important and where my suspension of disbelief just completely broke off and I couldn't believe I couldn't believe they were not able to write something a bit bit more sensical and a little bit more believable not only Lucky wakes up at the perfect precise moment when they are passing the spot where Mech crashed but he wakes up from what's presumably a rather brief nap after consuming drugs, after being snake bitten, and after being dehydrated and having that collapse in the middle of the road, he just wakes up from this nap and he is immediately so sharp, he instantly, without any problem whatsoever, notices the piano on the side of the road where the driver of the truck doesn't. And so he jumps out of the truck, and behold, he's right, that's the piano, and right, that's that, that right there, that's the hero, and that's Meg sitting next to it, in front of a dying baby camel. And so they are reunited, and they don't really even talk about it anymore. Like, later on, Meg passingly uh, apologizes for leaving Lucky effectively for dead. Uh, but she apologizes in a very by the way manner like they are talking about something else and she she maybe literally goes like oh by the way I'm sorry for how I did you back then and if I didn't crash into the baby camel presumably I would just keep driving and you would never find me and your piano so hey fate huh happy accidents huh yeah that 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 one really sticks out like a sore thumb to me because um, other than this moment it's not even a moment other than this piece of the plot everything else is just so good and so tight and so believable this particular piece is just a little too too much and forces it a little too hard the whole fate slash happy accidents thing yeah it's just yeah the fact it's at the half point doesn't help because afterwards there are further happy accidents of course but uh they dial it down again. Like, nothing is ever as crazy as this one thing, so... Yeah... But that's it, that's, that's pretty much my only complaint about the entire show. Alright, well, that's all I had to say, so um, thanks for watching if you did, and... Sort off!